Hi everyone, welcome back to Useful Genetics. This is lecture 9D, where we're going to revisit the genome-wide association studies that we introduced in module 5. I'll remind you of how GWAS studies work, and then we'll consider why they work. First, starting with the issue of causal versus non-causal SNPs, and then thinking about how the association part of the association part of GWAS decays over time um, in haplotype segments that, that contain non-causal SNPs and the phenotype changing alleles that we're really interested in. So how genome-wide association studies work? We use the example of a study on finding alleles that affect human height. And this is a spot population split into tall and short people who have been typed at about a million SNP positions looking for particular SNPs where tallness or shortness is correlated with different proportions of the alleles. These studies are carried out across, as I said, a million SNPs, flagging the ones where there is a difference between the tall people and the short people. The results are then commonly displayed in a diagram called a Manhattan plot, where the x-axis is positioned along all the chromosomes of the SNPs, and each dot represents a SNP at its position in the chromosome, with its height representing how different the versions in the tall and short people are. Almost all the SNPs are down here, with no significant difference, but some have very significant differences between tall people and short people. For instance, these SNPs here. So let's, now that we know about how inheritance works, let's think a little more deeply about this. So we could consider a hypothetical gene that regulates bony elongation and is responsible for part of the phenotypic differences in height that we see. A genome-wide association study might identify what we would call causal SNPs. This would be a SNP where the alleles that actually form the SNP the single nucleotide polymorphism, are themselves causing the difference in height. So in this case, the A allele causes more bony elongation than the G allele. The alternative is that many of the, of the SNPs that are found are in fact non-causal. They're in a part of the genome where they don't directly affect the phenotype. In this case, neither the A allele nor the G allele has anything to do with bony elongation. But they're not very far from a causal variation locus that does cause differences in bony elongation. In this case, the T allele here in this coding part of the protein causes more bony elongation than the C allele. But the big problem that understanding inheritance raises for us is why do these ancestral alleles stay together? Why do we find the A allele at the SNP in people who have the T allele in the bony elongation gene and are therefore going to be taller, and we find the G allele at the SNP primarily in people who have the C allele of the bony elongation gene? Well, the ancestors of all of the people in the study, and presumably of the people in the larger population, had these two haplotypes. Some of their chromosomes, some of their homologs of this chromosome, had the A allele at the SNP and the T allele at the bone growth position, and the others had the G allele at the SNP and the C allele at the bone growth position. So this is what we call an ancestral, we call it an ancestral haplotype or an ancestral association. Their descendants, the population that was sampled for the genome-wide association study, also has primarily alleles, haplotypes, chromosomes, where the A allele at the SNP locus is in the same DNA molecule as the T allele at the bony elongation locus, causing people to be tall, and the G allele is with the C allele that causes shortness. 
the question that our understanding of inheritance raises is why has this arrangement persisted over this long evolutionary time? Given that crossovers, we know crossovers occur everywhere in the chromosome, why haven't crossovers occurred between these two loci to generate chromosomes that have of the other combinations, the recombinant combinations of the A allele with the short variant and the G allele with the tall variant. We might expect that in fact over many generations there would have been enough crossing over that these four combinations were equally common so that if we surveyed the population we'd find that a quarter of the population had each of these. That's not what we see. We see that almost everybody has either this haplotype or this haplotype, and these haplotypes are very rare. Why would that be? Well, the answer is it's because over the kind of short segments that we're thinking about when we consider a the distance between a non-causal SNP and a causal variation in a nearby gene, crossovers are actually very rare. And I'll illustrate this with another diagram from another lecture, this time from Lecture 7Q. Here's a simplified drawing of a person's ancestry with the different alleles shown in different colors, and you can see that only some of these ancestors have segments represented in your chromosome. That indicates most haplotype segments are lost by chance events. The other component of this, the lucky haplotype segments that persist, slowly get shorter, but the key word here is slowly. This graph shows a, an analysis of how quickly we expect haplotype segments to get shorter given assumptions about the frequency of crossovers. We know that every chromosome gets at least one crossover, and big chromosomes usually get two or three. Um, if we assume for an average-sized chromosome that there's one or two crossovers for meiosis, after even 200 generations, the average haplotype segment is still 240,000 base pairs long. So what this tells us is that segments that are shorter than, say, 500,000 base pairs are very rarely disrupted by crossovers, less than once in 100 generations. Now, there's another side to this that we haven't considered yet, which is why hasn't mutation erased the association between the AG alleles of the SNP and the TC alleles at the causal locus that affects height? And that's because mutations are even more rare than crossovers. Here's the arithmetic. The mutation rate, it's about 10 to the minus 8th per base pair per generation. If we again consider, say, 100 generations, we could calculate how many base pairs, how many mutations per generation Per base pair, but how many base pairs do we need to consider? You might think that we need to consider all the base pairs in this interval, but we don't. Mutations that happen in the interval won't disrupt the connection between the A allele and the T allele. The only mutations we need to think about are mutations that occur right here and at the AG SNP, and mutations that occur right here at the causal variation locus. So we don't have to consider if this is, say, 100,000 base pairs long, 200,000, we still only have to consider two base pairs. And that means that over, if we do the arithmetic, we get the mutation rate is 2 times 10 to the minus 6th per hundred generations. This is the rate of mutations that would erase the association between the SNP and the causal variation. Only two chromosomes in a million over a hundred generations will have a mutation 
that changes an allele of the SNP or of the causal variation site. So I'm going to go quickly through this one more time with a slightly different example. Here's, here's our SNP locus again, and here's our height locus. And I'm assuming that they're, say, 200 base pairs apart. Because these haplotype segments are rarely disrupted by crossovers, less than one per 100 generations, and very rarely changed by mutation, about 2 times 10 to the minus 6 per 100 generations, alleles causing phenotypic differences are going to remain tightly linked to the ancestral SNP alleles that they were originally linked to. And we'll see this in the descendants. And this is what a genome-wide association study detects. This linkage between the SNP locus and the height locus. So what we've done, we've had a reminder of genome-wide association studies. We've clarified the distinction between causal SNPs and non-causal SNPs. And we've addressed the issue of how come GWAS works for non-causal SNPs. And it's because crossovers and mutation both are extremely rare along the short distances that GWAS is detecting when it detects an association between a non-causal SNP and a causal allele in the genome. Coming up next, we're going to talk about how do we evaluate genome-wide association studies. Are they, how do you decide that a particular association is really significant? I hope to see you there.